Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Boy, sometimes, you know, the weather's been so nice. We're just outside. We're doing all kinds of stuff. And boy, am I feeling it <laughs> there and there and there. And, you know, Mary Margaret said it was really good for me to have uh, this watch, this smart watch that's smarter than me because it counts all my steps, you know. And as some of you wear uh, these uh, uh, pedometers and all that stuff that are built into your watch. Well, some of us wear these pedometers to what? to uh, see how many steps we can get in a day, right? Yeah, we got to hit that 10,000 steps a day that's recommended by the American Heart Association, right? Sometimes, though, if you're like me, uh, I, I, I'm encouraged to keep track of my step count so that I don't get too many, that I'm pacing myself. That's, that's been the name of the game for my life most of the time that you all have known me. So anyway, uh, this idea of uh, go, 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 do, do, do. Ah, give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Sometimes we need to look back at the strength that we had when we were youth, more youthful than we are. Um, one of my mentors was my youth pastor, and he became the, the senior pastor of the church I grew up in. Uh, as he got older in the age range that you might expect, uh, a youth pastor to be, he, uh, he started calling himself the youthful minister. <laughs> and so, yeah, sometimes we need to call back on the same strength, the same vigor, uh, who, who I think, you know, I'm thinking of Caleb maybe now. Caleb was an, a, an example of one who, give me that hill, I, I, I'll go. That same enthusiasm, that same vigor. So for us as New Testament Christians, when we have um, a, a sense of the energy that, that's available for a day, and we see a big need out there, where do we where do we come down on everything that we've been talking about so far this summer in our one another series? Um, we're going to look at the second part of what it is to serve one another. In fact, as we look at serving one another, part two, I invite you to turn with me to Philippians two. Now, last Sunday we were in Ephesians 4, and we talked about the idea of when we're going to serve one another, we need to do it in love. We can't do it uh, grumbly. We can't do it uh, uh, hatefully. Rather, we need to do it lovingly and, and gratefully and, and humbly. And as we love our neighbor as ourselves, in other words, as we put as much uh, heart into what we do, for others as we do uh, for the Lord and for ourselves, then uh, that's another aspect of, of serving. And the, the church there had an issue. Uh, they, they, they didn't quite get along with each other the way they should. And so watch out if you keep on bickering and, and nagging and fighting and complaining at each other. Watch out or else you're going to be devoured by one another. But the key here was this. To live by the Spirit. If we're going to live by the Spirit, it means that we're not going to gratify the sinful nature. In other words, we're not going to do what we think's best. We're not going to do something that will gratify ourselves, but rather we will gratify God and glorify God. Uh, you know, the, this conflict that we all face is what? Is that sinful nature. And we all struggle with it, and we're all going to struggle with it until the day we see Jesus face to face. But if you are led by the law, I mean, led, led by the Spirit, rather, you are not under law. That's the thing. Jesus has freed us from the curse and the stain of the law. We're freed to do what? To serve one another. That's what true freedom is, serving God, serving one another. Slavery is getting back to that issue from verse 15 where the folks were destroying one another. So how is it that we can effectively serve one another in love? We need to look at the example of Jesus. And we need to serve then with a Christ-like attitude. If you're there, um, follow along with me starting at verse 1 as we take a look at these uh, first uh, few verses we find that this was a very sensitive subject for, for Paul. 
uh, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, look at those words there. Look at those words. This is how uh, devoted the Apostle Paul was to the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, but then also to his people. Look at the product of discipleship. When we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the product? What does it produce in our lives? It produces some of these, these things. Encouragement. Encouragement. Are you encouraged in your walk with the Lord? Our encouragement needs to come from being united with Jesus Christ. Not from any of our circumstances that we face. Not from any of the relationships that we have horizontally on this earth. But our biggest encouragement needs to come from our being united with Christ. If you've, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you need to be encouraged. That needs to be something that happens every day. And, and Tim did hand me the daily breads for next month. They're here. So if you want to grab one and be ready for September 1st, here you go. Daily bread is a small print edition. Large print is still uh, goes through the month of September. So they're available. Take one home, take some to share. Anyway, uh, we in our daily time with the Lord, that's where we can receive that encouragement. How about this next phrase? If any comfort from his love. Comfort. We all need to be comforted. Can you believe that in less than a month, it will be 20 years since the 9-11 attacks? 20 years in New York, Washington, and then in that field outside of, out, uh, in western Pennsylvania. And who knows, you know, all the other ripple effects that there were. 20 years. Boy, our nation turned to the Lord for comfort. Where do we get our comfort from now? Yeah. Not that there's no seeking of the Lord, but boy, sometimes we find that the world around us looks for comfort from anywhere but God's love. We can be comforted in knowing that Jesus loves us. This we know, for the Bible tells us so. The little ones and all of us too, to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves us. That is comforting. Isn't that interesting that that's a lullaby? Comfort from his love. If any fellowship with the Spirit, worry less, pray more. I think that's what that says. I've, I've, I've been waiting for the Sunday that that falls off, so it happened. There we go. I'm going to put that there just in case it happens again. Uh, if I was in preaching lab back in seminary, the lectern we used was so flimsy, even if we touched it, it went right over. That's how they told us, taught us not to lean on the pulpit. That was a lot of years ago. Anyway, uh, if any um, fellowship with the Spirit, fellowship with the Spirit, who do you walk with? In whose power do we walk? When we are in fellowship with the Spirit, if we are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit and we are experiencing the leading of the Spirit because uh, we're, what, encouraged, we're comforted, if we have fellowship with the Spirit, then we're walking with Him and we're exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. You know what that is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against things, these things there is no law. Are we in fellowship with the Spirit? Are we being led by Him? The last one, if any tenderness and compassion. Remember the presidential candidate who talked about a kinder, gentler nation? Boy, and we've come back around, haven't we? We need a kinder and gentler nation in so many ways. If, in, if any tenderness... Well, what's the opposite of tenderness? Callousness. You know, if I uh, do some shoveling or raking and I don't have gloves on anymore, <laughs> I don't have the calluses on my hand. I get blisters. 
So, you know, don't be callous. And the other word is compassion. 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 What's the opposite of compassion? Yeah. The word that comes to my mind is gnarliness. There's a lot of gnarly people out there. Yeah. We need to be tender. We need to be compassionate. If any of this is true, look at verse 2 then. Then make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. There's Paul, their church planter, their first pastor, their encourager, their cheerleader, the one who gives thanks for these folks as he remembers them in prayer. Here's the product of his discipleship that he's looking for. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. How do you work out this encouragement and comfort and fellowship and tenderness and compassion? There's verse 2. Then look at verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. That's how being comforted by Christ works itself out. That's how being led by the Spirit works itself out as we seek to serve one another. Don't do it out of what? Selfish ambition, vain conceit. Not to show everybody how great I am, how much I do. Let's, uh, let's add to my resume. No. But in humility, in humility, that doesn't mean be a doormat. It does mean recognize who you are in light of who God is. Let him be seen. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests. Okay, so Paul's being honest about that assumption, isn't he? We all look out to our own interests. Yeah. My alarm went off this morning, and uh, I rolled over. I just shut it off and rolled over. I was not interested in getting up. I was interested in rolling over and getting more sleep. But then the dog started barking. Well, there, there was a family of geese that decided to camp out in our front yard, or, I guess, and they were a little bit of, they were a little loud about it. So, okay, I'll get up. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, I had a job to do today. I better get up and get ready and get going here. When it comes down to it, when we take a look at why we ought to serve one another, it comes down to not only these things in the first four verses, but our reasoning comes down to our attitude. And that is serving with a Christ-like attitude. And that's what we see in verse 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Your attitude, Paul says, should be the same, congruent, equal to, completely consumed with the attitude of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? There are five things here that we want to take a look at that will help us to understand a Christ-like attitude. Who? Being in very nature God. Okay. In very nature God. That's who Jesus is. He is God. Now we know and we have heard that there are many who will say that he was just a good man. There will be many who will say, well, <laughs> when he died on the cross... He died for, his, for himself. Nothing special about him. When it comes to the resurrection, they'll say, he wasn't God. He rolled that stone away. Yeah, but he wasn't really, if he wasn't really dead to begin with, then what does that matter? There are all kinds of ways that people will deny the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is in very nature. In other words, his, his central essence what makes him him is that he is God. He is God 100%. 100% God, but also we'll see in a little bit that he was also 100% man. We'll get to that in a minute. 
But this 100% God can't be taken away. When those who want to twist truth, when they want to take a shot at who God is, they will take something away from our Lord Jesus Christ that is rightfully his. We take God's word as truth. We believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is accurate. We take that by faith. And our Bible tells us that Jesus is God, being in very nature God. So let's turn that question around. Who are you by nature? If we're going to serve with a Christ-like attitude, what is our nature? Well, we know we have a sinful nature, right? We talked about that a little bit last week. But if we are born again, what happens to that sinful nature? The penalty of sin has been paid for by the Lord Jesus. And so we have a new nature. We are made new by what? The renewing that comes by the Holy Spirit when he takes up residence in our lives. Our nature doesn't have to be that of our sinful nature. Rather, yes, the sinful nature and our born-again nature, they're, they're in conflict with one another while we walk on this earth. But our nature is redeemed. Our nature is renewed. Our nature is saved. Our nature has been changed. And so we can have a Christ-like attitude when we walk according to our new nature, not our old nature. What's the next thing? As we go along here, uh, we see that Jesus had a position. The second part of verse 6. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Okay. Did not consider equality with God. Jesus' position was equality with God. Now, be very careful. In our society, there is this catchword that's come up in the last few years called equity, where our, our culture and our society uh, thinks that it is necessary that there be equity equity. Isn't that what I build up in the value of my home when I get my mortgage paid off? I have home equity. I have a value that uh, can be put in dollars and cents. Um, this idea of equity, you know, isn't it interesting that for me, it seems to me that it goes hand in hand with this critical race theory that's being, that's being pushed. This idea of seeking justice and because we are of a certain uh, ethnicity that uh, we need to forcefully get pushed down so that others of other ethnicities can be raised back up. And they think it's equality, but what they're saying is equity. Let's not get confused by that. Jesus did not consider equality with God. What is equality? That means 100% it, it joins together equals. Two plus two does equal four. It's a timeless standard truth. Jesus' position as God, he was there with God in the beginning. It was by their creative word that God the Father and God the Son created heaven and earth. And man was created in God's image, male and female. He created them. We are of one race, the human race. Our position is if we are in Christ, we're what? Jesus is God's son. He is equal in nature. He is equal in position. He is fully God. We're adopted. We're adopted. Our position is an adopted son of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If we're going to serve with a Christ-like attitude, we can do so as an adopted heir of the king of kings. That's our position. Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. We'll see what he did about that in a minute. But just think of your position. Jesus left his position, so to speak, his placement in heaven. He came to earth. He didn't consider that something to be grasped. Rather, we see, what, verse 7, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, 
being made in human likeness. Yeah. Jesus was incarnated. When we talk about the incarnation of Christ, it means that he took on what? He took on a human body. He didn't grasp his nature of God. Well, look how Paul writes about this here. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he describes it as taking on the nature, the very nature of what? A servant. A servant. Wow. Jesus went through a change. Can you imagine being 100% God, having all of the attributes, all of the privileges of being God to take on a human body? Yeah, wow. Wow, what a transformation. Yet, if we are going to serve with a Christ-like attitude, we need to be transformed. Where does transforming, where does transform, tra transformation take place in our lives? Don't be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what it says in Romans 12. Yeah. Our transformation happens in the mind. Jesus took on the form of a servant. We need to start thinking like servants. We need to think, start thinking like servants. That's where our transformation takes place as heirs of the king. What else? Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man... Okay. Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He did what? He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Hmm. Humility. Serving with humility. It's that kind of serving that happens without any headlines, without any hits on your Facebook page, your Twitter feed. It's done not to be seen by men, but it's done to be seen by God. Jesus humbled himself. We only have a snippet of what Jesus did on this earth, don't we, in, in the Gospels. How much more did he do? And how much more did he do that really nobody saw as he spent time with his father? He humbled himself. But in this situation, as he humbled himself, we have to, we can't not, I know it's a double negative, but we can't not separate the reason that Jesus came. In humility, he took our sin upon himself. He didn't have to. He didn't, uh, he might not have chosen to, but because he loved us so much, he did. He humbled himself and he took on all of the all of the privileges, but also all of the risks of a human body. But what was different about him is that, as you know, he did not sin. He was tempted in every way, just as we are. But he didn't sin. Because he was God, he could say no. He could say no to the devil. In fact, we have lots of examples of him, him saying no to the devil. But humility, bottom line, taking on something that was not rightfully his. And yet doing it because he loved us. And then the last thing we have here is his obedience. He became obedient to death. He became obedient to death. He could have said no up to the point where he breathed out his last. He could have summoned 10,000 angels to come and take him down off the cross, but he didn't. He bled and died to take away the penalty of sin, even death on a cross. I like how Paul adds that at the end. It could have been, it would have been enough just to say obedient to death. But that meant something. Those four or five words, that meant something to the readers, even death on a cross. 
the most shameful, the most humiliating, the most gruesome way to die. That's how Jesus died. When we serve, we need to serve with a Christ-like attitude, looking at our nature, our new nature, not our old nature, our position, sons and daughters adopted by the king of kings, transformation, the transforming process in our minds, humility and obedience. What did God do for Jesus? Therefore, I, I can't skip it, you know that. Therefore, because of all that, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the knee of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's why we serve. Now, Jesus shared some examples. These are some familiar stories that we know that I want to use to connect and help us to drive home some ideas about Jesus' teaching on serving and his example. In Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25, we're not going to read all of these passages, but as we get the idea, these stories will come back very easily. In Luke chapter 10, on one occasion, an expert in law stood up to test Jesus' teacher. He asked, what must I do to, etern to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus says. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Not like Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? He says, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. This priest went down, passed by on one side. A Levite went down, passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him, took out coins. Here's a deposit. When I come back, take care of him. When I come back, if there's any more I owe, I'll pay you. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus said, hmm. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. You see, Jesus came not, oops, I'm way off on my outline, am I not? I got it. <laughs> Sorry, I did my uh, I did my outline exactly backwards. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> now you have it all. Here's your imperfect pastor. Love God, love your neighbor, serving freely and mercifully. So what about, then, washing the disciples' feet? That's in John 13. <laughs> in John 13, we see um, a situation where it was just before the Passover. Um, you know the story. The evening meal was served. Judas Iscariot had already been tempted. Satan had already come along and said, hey, this is your job. Jesus went around the circle and washed his disciples' feet. Now, their footwear wasn't anything close to even our sandals today. Feet were, got dirty. They got dusty. They had calluses. Yeah, they probably even had ingrown toenails. But anyway, he came to S Peter and said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus says, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. 
No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus unwashed. I wash your feet. You have no part with me. Then, not just my feet, but all of me. Jesus then went on and said, you know, do you understand what I've done for you here? You call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example. And then later on, at the end of the passage, he says, you know, no servant's greater than his master. Jesus didn't come to serve. I didn't come to be served. He came to serve. It comes down to the purpose. Jesus did his teaching. Yes, he being the living water, he washes us and washes away the power of sin whiter than snow. And in washing the disciples' feet, he demonstrated that uh, we need to be willing to humble ourselves and take on the role of a servant. Later on in that scenario, after Judas went out to betray Jesus, when we get to Luke chapter 22, I did get this reference right, and it's in the right position. Uh, we see after the establishment of the Lord's Supper, what happened? What happened was that there a dispute arose among them about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. The answer to that is it's, it's the one who serves. It's the one who serves. You see, Jesus said, you know, what happens is that uh, the kings of the Gentiles, Luke 22, 25, Jesus says the Gentiles, the kings, lorded over them. Those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be the, like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Who's greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table, but I'm among you as one who serves. I serve because that's what God sent me to do. And I serve so that you can as an heir, my adopted brother and sister, you can sit at my table in my kingdom. And then he turns to Simon. He says, Peter, <laughs> Satan's asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Why do we serve? We serve to serve the kingdom but also to strengthen the brethren and sister in the faith. When we look at Jesus' teaching of washing the disciples' feet, when we look at Jesus' teaching about the Good Samaritan, when we look at the teaching about who is great in the kingdom, we see that the one who is greatest is the one who serves and strengthens people. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And if we're going to do that act of service, we need to do so loving God, loving our neighbor, serving freely and mercifully. When we grasp that, we will serve one another with the same energy and the same compassion and the same fruit as Jesus served us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your purpose for him and how your purpose for him is remarkably interwoven with your purpose for us. Father, help us to see and to act upon how you would want us to serve you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our example as our Savior. Lord, help us to walk in step with your Spirit that we might be renewed, that we might be transformed, and that we might be obedient. 
We ask all this for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen.